I'm Adrian Swinscoe. I'm here to, I had a broad topic, which is human versus technology. Um, before I get started, I wanted to tell you a little bit about myself. I do these things, which means um, I fix some problems, uh, I do some writing, I do some sort of speaking in workshops, and generally it's mostly around the area of service experience engagement, both customer and um, employee sort of stuff. Um, as Andrew kindly said, I did write a book last year. It came, um, came out um, in 2015, came out in 2016. It achieved bestseller status, which is brilliant because now my mum and dad think I've got a proper job, which is brilliant. Um, they sort of understand what, is, uh, what I do. But to start today, I wanted to talk to you a bit about customer experience, just to frame kind of where I think that we are and some of the challenges that we, we're, face, we're facing. Uh, this number is a number that's reported and much quoted. It comes from Gartner, which says that now 89% of all companies agree that they are competing primarily on customer experience, the experience that they give their customers. And given all of that, they, um, there's a lot of people piling into customer experience and thinking it's really important and it's becoming you know, a strategic imperative. And then there's a whole bunch of research that shows kind of what the return for doing this is. And this is an amalgamation of a series of different studies that show what companies get by investing in customer experience and also leading their market. They outperform the market, they grow faster, more profitable, retain customers for longer, and these uh, customers tend to spend more with them. Now, that's all very well, you, you might say. But also part of that, and the, the biggest thing that's going on, it seems to me right now, within the customer experience of domain, is there's a whole bunch of people that are investing really, really heavily into technology. All these type of things, um, and particularly in the digital domain, to drive the improvement of their customer experience. Everything mobile apps to IoT, location services, voice command, RFID, sensors and so on and so forth. And that's not even before we get to the robots. And we talk about AI and robotics and automation and all these different sort of things and how much is that's going to have such a huge impact. And I think this is, this is brilliant. It's all really, really, really exciting, very, very interesting. And I think the possibilities are, are, are fantastic. Um, and one of the other things that's, that's going on organizationally is that we've seen a proliferation of channels through which that we serve our, our, our customers. There was a piece of research that came out recently that from Dimension Data that said on average, large organizations, or most actually organizations, serve their customers through nine different channels. And that number is set to grow to 11 different channels over the course of the next 18 to 24 months. The problem with that is that most of those, if you ask those same companies, the problem with that is that most of those channels aren't connected. In fact, about 70, 80% of those, those companies that report these numbers will turn around and say, actually, we've only got one or two of them connected. And what that means is that it manifests itself in this inconsistent and unconnected digital and physical customer experience. Because one of the problems that they have is that they end up, well, when they add a channel, they are, they're adding a channel, they add another team or another department, which means you add, we, we talk about one of the, the organizations talk about one of the major problems that they face is this siloed behavior, lack of communication across silos. This just exacerbates the problem. Adding more doesn't actually fix it. So there's a big old kind of, you know, it's exciting, it's interesting, it's what customers want, but there's also some big challenges. Um, I just said, but what customers are actually kind of telling us is that they just find a lot of this frustrating. Employees find it frustrating too, because they actually, most, most employees, they want to help the customers actually uh, do what they want to do. And there's a piece of research, a piece of pan European, actually global research, that was done by Accenture last, uh, late, late, late last year. This is just a share of uh, some of the different kind of countries, but if we zoom in on one, because most of the results are the same, what it implies is that companies have been investing very, very heavily in technology. But what they've been, uh, they've been investing so much into technology, what they're at risk of doing is creating a humanless customer experience. They are making it, uh, they are not listening to their customers. They talk about being customer centric and listening to customers and responding to them. 
but actually the customers are saying otherwise. The customers are saying, actually, you know, I like the self-service sort of things. I like to be able to find information on, 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 on a website when I really want it. But when things get a little bit hard, or things get a little bit complicated, or I just really want some help, I'd like to talk to somebody. And so there is a danger that we're actually, there is a disconnect between what companies are delivering and what customers want. Does that make sense? So, with, in light of all that, I think the, the, the one of the things that we, we've got to, and within the theme of this, this, this conference and related to this conference is that we've got to look at the customer experience, we've got to look at service, look at, look at the overall kind of journey, and we actually have to start to step back, I think, and actually start to think about what is advocacy. Because when we talk about influence, we're really talking about advocacy. How do we build advocacy? And that, through my research, I wanted to share with you a couple of things some simple stuff that I think that um, companies should be doing more of, and then also some stories to try and fill that out. So um, the first thing is I just wish that companies would do the basics brilliantly. More often than not, we get caught up in the fancy stuff. The fancy stuff is all is the stuff that gets invested in. The fancy stuff is, is, is it's sexy, it's exciting, it's new, it's interesting. But if you notice, the people that are brilliant at service and experience do the basics really, really well. They execute really, 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 really well. And it's the foundation, I think, upon which you build a lot of loyalty and advocacy and repeat business. But it's not exciting. It's quite boring. But it takes commitment and it takes discipline. And it's hard to do. Um, anybody recognize this image? And we've got, still got, who's got a graphic equalizer still in their, in their house? Brilliant. Not a physical one, no? Um, but I think there's a challenge going forward that we have, to, we have to grapple with. We have to understand that um, all our customers aren't necessarily digital natives or digital savvy. And actually, even the ones that are don't necessarily always want digital solutions. And actually, we need to think about both our customers across the journey and the different types of customers, and think about what is the right balance between the human touch and technology across the piece to, so we can deliver the right service and the right experience to our customers at the right time. I'm going to lay, I'm, because I'm a, I'm a service experience uh, Sort of guy. This is kind of where I come, where I come from, where I kind of how I see things. It's also worth asking this: the, the question of where do we actually earn loyalty? Where do we build this trust that allows us to build this foundation of advocacy? And research shows it's only two places across the whole journey, and it accounts for about ninety percent of all of our loyalty. And the two places are at the point of purchase or the point of transaction and at the point of when something goes wrong. Because those are the two most, in the minds of the customers, those are the two most important elements. So those are the two areas that, that we, I think that we should, we should focus on to develop that foundation of loyalty, and that foundation of trust. I think that brands should consider doing this, becoming more, that traditionally service has been reactive in nature but we have the tools and the technology and the data now to become more proactive in our service that we deliver to customers. I mean, if I said to you that the corporate executive board did a piece of research a, uh, a while ago that showed that 60% of all requests into a contact center or a help desk or a support desk came about because customers couldn't find what they were looking for on, their, on the company's website, then there's a huge opportunity for us to be a bit more proactive. You know, there's another piece of research that was done by a contact center research company called Sabio, who said, who estimated that between 25 and 40% of all calls into contact centers were avoidable. So, so 
what I'm trying to imply on you is that actually loyalty and advocacy and trust is a whole business effort. And actually, if we look at it th from a whole business perspective, we can realize that there's, there is um, a bunch of things that we can eliminate or we can do that can build better satisfaction, better experience, more trust with our customers. Um, that's my mum and dad on their wedding day. I thought it was a bit of a personal story, but it's a, it's, it's a good one. The, whose mum taught them this idea? Whose mum taught them that if they don't ask, you don't get? Whose mum taught them that? Brilliant. Great, so it's not just my mum. So that's my mum, that's my dad. Um, and my mum taught me that when I, was, when I was a kid. And what's interesting is that I think there's lessons in that for businesses. Because businesses talk about advocacy, they talk about referrals. But actually, if you ask businesses, what are they doing to actually um, f and formally encourage those, uh, those referrals and those uh, recommendations? Many of them are not doing very much. There was a piece of um, research that was done, I think it was focused on professional services firms, and they, they, they surveyed a whole bunch of, between 500 and 1,000 professional services firms um, about what their growth strategies were. And then these firms turned around and said, a big part of our growth is based on customer referrals. That was the majority of the firms. And then, but when asked, when, when they, they were interrogated about kind of what, was, what they were doing to do that, they were saying, and they were asked the question, so what are you doing to encourage those referrals? And they were like, well, nothing. It's just going to happen. And I think the point is, is that actually many organizations suffer from this. It feels obvious. But it's, it, it's so obvious that, you know, people miss it is actually sometimes you actually have to ask your customers to advocate on your behalf. You have to kind of help them advocate it because actually many people want to do it, but they just don't know how to do it. Or they forget because you're not top of mind. Um, so here's another thing I wanted to, um, to, and I added this slide in this morning after hearing kind of Brian talk. Um, and it's just a comment on the idea of influence. And that influence, it, influence and digital are not the same thing. Digital is a medium. And here's an interesting thing, is that there's a group of customers that are out there. They are possibly, some of the people in the assembled audience, they are possibly our mothers and fathers. But they are the richest generation we've never known. And they hold most of the wealth and most of the disposable income. But here's the killer, ladies and gentlemen. Only 5% of ad spend is targeted at the, the over 50s. I think that's a huge, huge opportunity. And the point I wanted to make with this slide is that, not because I'm not over 50, even though I've got lots of gray hair, um, is that I think that if we only concentrate on digital channels, we miss, we miss a huge opportunity. And influence can exist without, with, outside of digital kind of channels. It may be in a community group. It may be in a newspaper. It may be in a magazine. It may be in some other format. But influence and digital, be careful not to conflate the two things together. So let me tell you a few stories about how to bring this to life. This is a firm called Brainshark. They are a sales enablement SaaS software provider. Um, they had a advocacy program, customer champion program that they were building. And they kind of they did lots of thought about it. They developed all this content. And they can start to put it out, put communication through those kind of channels. And then it went, yay, and died. And as many people have talked about before, and um, what these guys learned the hard way is that if you don't get your employees involved and don't help your employees understand what it means to, to build a uh, customer champions program and, and, how you can, and how you can match it, it's the two sides of, the, of a different 
two sides of the same coin, is you've got to have a, an employee ambassador program as well as a customer champion program. And you've got to match those things together to, to bring it to life. And they won a whole bunch of awards from Forrester around the, 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 what they were doing because of that. Um, but they, they learned it the, the hard way. So if you're not building an advocacy program that is mirrored on the inside of your organization, I think you're possibly missing a trick. Um, here's another story, and this is from Swisscom. And what they've done is really interesting is like actually, rather than thinking about advocacy um, and, and doing it through content, what they've done is they've built a network of their customers. They've realized there's a difference in their customers and that some customers are more technologically savvy than others. But actually, there's pro they have proximity. And what they're doing is they're connecting their customers up to each other. So you might have uh, an elderly lady who's got an, a new iPad that needs some help setting it up, connecting it to a Wi-Fi router and things. But actually, this chap or this chap might be kind of one of their closest neighbors. And they're building this network of customers that are helping each other. So they're changing their influence and their advocacy that way. That's built on a platform called Myla uh, that Swisscom actually liked. They started a trial with them. Swisscom liked them so much they ended up buying them. But that's been hugely successful because what they're doing is they're looking at this influence and advocacy and uh, connectedness in a very, very different sort of way. Um, the other thing that uh, story uh, about Patagonia, but particularly about this, Anybody heard of the, the Warnware Initiative from Patagonia? One gentleman at the back. Um, if you haven't heard about it, is what Patagonia have done, and this is, this is it started with a, a van, a repair van that used to go around all the shops, and what Patagonia have been trying to do is to say, it's built on this idea is they want to advocate for um, conscious consumption. They were saying, they, they have this, this idea, they were saying, don't buy a new jacket or a new top if we can repair it. Bring it to us and we'll repair it for free and you return it back to us. But actually they've gone and beyond that now and they've actually started a, um, a, an initiative, it's called Warn it's Patagonia Warnware, so I think it's warnware.com, and it, as, where people can send their, um, their old Patagonia clothing to get, get mended, they'll get sent back, but they can also just donate it and it gets recycled, it's repaired, recycled and sold on to other members of the community. That part of their business is growing at a rate of 25% faster than any other part of their business. And the reason being is people are starting to subscribe to this whole idea of the purpose of what they're trying to do, this um, elevating this idea of conscious consumption. So they're doing it through actually trying to figure out, not just through their advocates, but actually figuring out a, an initiative that dials into a purpose that's shared amongst their, their customers or a concern that's shared amongst their customers. Um, a similar, anybody heard of this company, Hyatt Denim? Hyatt Denim Jeans. Lady, the, Hyatt Denim. Oh, so you know the story. You know the story? You know the, no. Okay. So, Hyatt Denim was actually started by um, David Hyatt and his wife, one of the original founders of Howie's. Um, Hyatt is based in Cardigan in Wales. Um, Cardigan, a number of years ago, used to be one of the towns that produces the most denim in the whole of Europe. Um, and then when there was a whole bunch of offshoring, uh, the, the industry died in that, in, that, in that town. And so you had all this kind of fancy denim making skills that was in this kind of town, but no employment anymore, no factories, just gone. And David thought, actually, came along a few years ago, thought that's just rubbish. Um, so he thought, well, actually, why don't we start up the Hyatt Denim Company as a way of trying regenerating the town? To re, you know, um, using all the skills that are already in the, in, in the town. And the idea being they're going to, rather than making the most jeans, they're going to try and make the best jeans that they can make. And it's all trying to put the heart and soul back into things, but also the art back into things. So actually, anybody who's got a pair of high jeans, you'll know that they actually get signed by everybody who, gets, who makes them. They're brilliant, because they believe that if you're an artist or an artisan, that you should sign your work. So inside a pair of my jeans, inside the pocket, there's, it's signed by a lady called Jean, I think it is, funnily enough. <laughs> who knew? Um, but that's their purpose. 
thing. And by doing something that, that they think matters, it actually starts to matter to other people and people start to talk about it. Similar example, which is not sort of UK based, but who's heard of Tom's? Buy one set of pair of shoes, give, uh, donate another kind of pair. Who's got a pair of Tom's? Brilliant, You've, you know, you vote with your cash. It's the same sort of idea. Here's another one that you probably, I hope you've heard of, um, but maybe you haven't. You, you've all heard of Tom, Tom, uh, Timson, rather. Yeah, the cobblers, right? Did you know that they are the largest employer of ex-offenders in the whole of the UK? Cutting Pardon? Cutting no, not cutting keys. But who knew that they were the largest employer of ex-offenders? So one, two, a few people. All right, well, for the rest of you, Timson uh, is on this, this idea that about the, uh, and it's not John Timson's original idea, it was his late wife's original idea, and it's all about giving people a second chance. And how in British society right now, we're not really about giving people second chances, and they were saying, well, actually, we should be. And they started... Um, it was the idea of, idea of his wife, but it was taken on by, um, by his son, who now runs as a CEO of the business. Um, and they started looking to try and recruit people out of prisons. I've gone even further. They actually recruit people directly in prisons, and they've got a training facility in a couple of prisons in the northwest of, uh, of England. And they have had people that have run shops for them while they've also been in prison. So imagine in a cell, get up in the morning, put on your uniform, get let out of your cell, you walk to work, out of the gates, walk to work, open up the shop, do all the business, sort of thing, cash up, put it in the bank, walk back to the prison. It's a bit crazy. They had a store manager that was doing that for about a year as he was working his way out of the system. The point about that is that, that's a, that, that for me, they just do that because that's what they're about. But when people start to hear about it, is people start to talk about that. And I think that's the thing that I... I think about is when we start thinking about service experience or advocacy or uh, loyalty or trust or all those sort of things, a lot of it's not about, it's about what we say or something. It's actually more about what we do. Because doing stuff like that is worthy of getting talked about. And it's worthy of, kind of people's trust. Um, and so maybe my question to yourselves as, as organizations, as brands, is like, what are you doing that's worthy of getting talked about? I mean, talked about in a sustainable way. So here's some final words. Um, first of all, this is a reality check. This comes from a piece of research from Lithium that came out this year. It was about the state of social engagement. I had a chance to speak to Rob Tarkoff of, of, of Lithium the other day, and he was, we were talking about this. And whether you agree with it or not, it's sort of a stark number. And this is on a self-reported basis. Only 1% of brands think that they are developing meaningful relationships with their advocates and influencers. So I actually think it means that, that there's, there's a lot of work to do. And I think that actually you can think about content and you can think about identifying your influencers and you can think about advocacy campaigns and you can think about all of those different things and I think that's great. But I think it's part of the picture. And I think that you can take a more of a whole organization approach to things. You can try and get your organization to be brilliant at the basics, to strike that right balance of the human and te technology and your customer experience to realize that where, if you focus on where you could win and or lose loyalty, then you, you'll, you'll start to build loyalty. You can be more proactive. You can ask for people to advocate for you because actually, and help them understand what that means and how to do that, and you'll, it'll push you forward. Um, follow the money is all about, well, um, not all our customers that we should have are necessarily going to be digital, or digital isn't necessarily the, the only channel that we should be thinking about. Get your, get your customers and your employees involved, but also tell bigger and better stories. Do stuff that people want to talk about, and then people will advocate for you. And that's all, folks. <laughs>